Good afternoon, everybody. It is Friday and the 15th of July, halfway through July. You're here at Lunch and Learn. I hope everyone's doing well. We're going to get folks unmuted, and then uh, today is uh, open discussion. Well, we could also continue our discussion on trauma. Yeah. Mm, love that. It's, which is a hot one, and uh, Carl had just stirred the pot last time, and uh, uh, we only touched on part of, you know, what was up for grabs in all of that discussion and posted. And there was still plenty, plenty of ground to cover yet. You know, there's uh, different ways that people are treating trauma and, and it, it, you know, uh, different methods of intervention like EMDR. Or cognitive behavioral therapy is the one that's touted by um, a lot of experts, and I think it's probably most fairly recognized as far as insurance goes. Um, like cognitive behavioral therapy came straight out of research, and uh, um, Aaron Beck, Judith Beck, Martin Seligman, and all those people in the 80s in the 90s of the previous century, it sounds strange to say at this point, but it was the previous century. Um, and that's the go-to. And neurofeedback was cut its teeth on trauma because trauma is a key component of alcohol abuse and self-medication. And it's a key component of a uh, war. And at the Menninger Clinic, they first started with alcoholics and they had a biological marker. They were taking blood samples and they found changes in blood endorphin levels. Um, and not only did they find MMPI changes that were dramatic and that's empirical stuff, they found changes in, in, the, in these people's blood. And then they went, and by the way, they were doing training twice a day, I think. Yeah, as I recall. At first it looked like once a day, but then it turned out it was twice a day uh, when you start digging into the literature more. And which we would have all liked to have known, but nobody was reporting very accurately on it apparently. And uh, as a consequence, uh, they moved into training uh, veterans from Vietnam because they were using people from a Veterans Administration hospital. And then the veterans were responding just as well. Here's this incredible technology. Um, and the military was also using neurofeedback in black programs and training pilots. The Russians were training pilots with neurofeedback as well. So everybody was training pilots. And then NASA started training astronauts with neurofeedback. Meantime, all the, here's all of these people using it for war and trauma reasons and throwing tons of taxpayer money at it and psychiatric and psychology community was like, this is like, you know, hogwash. It's, you know, woo woo stuff, you know, why are we, why are you wasting your time with that? And it's still that sentiment. But that was the same sentiment that was around when that guy came along and said, you know, if you wash your hands, more people don't die in 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 uh, delivery, you know, during birth. And they all said, oh, you're an idiot. That's woo-woo stuff. And he died in poverty in jail. I mean, this is an old story in medicine and science. So we shouldn't be surprised that neurofeedback is still dealing with that. And it's true. Interestingly enough, EMDR came along in the 90s, and I remember that because I was clinically doing neurofeedback with traumatized people in the 90s, uh, and some of them were Vietnam vets, and some of them were uh, people who had been tortured in uh, religious cults or abused, uh, you know, the dark cults. They were physically tortured in the, uh, in the more positive religious cults. They were just sexually abused, but they were both traumatized people, and we were training people like that, and we were ended up using EMDR and Alpha Theta side by side, uh, and it was just blowing the minds of all the therapists in in 
Phoenix, they were sending people us left and right to um, accelerate um, the recovery, and it was working good. I mean, we were having lunches with all of these therapists, huge lunches, and we were all talking about, you know, trading clients. And I thought that was going to be the future of neurofeedback, but um, so much pushback and whittle and whittling it down. Um, and Bill Scott continued doing research in neurofeedback with Penniston looking over his shoulder. Meanwhile, Penniston was backwatered and fired because uh, the medical community didn't want to have anything to do with him, particularly the Veterans Administration. He was a rate buster and a troublemaker. And you shouldn't be surprised at that because I have another associate who was doing um, alpha theta training for soldiers downrange in combat. And even the intel people were sneaking in and doing pre-raid sessions. Um, and uh, all the lo local commanders at the other bases downrange got together and said, what are you doing? You're making us look bad. You're going back home. So <laughs> neurofeedback has been something that has been seen by a threat and yet as a possible advantage strangely enough at the same time which actually isn't that strange because the military left and right hand never knows what it's doing usually it's so big and we have all of the stuff that was written about it and now you rarely hear that much about alpha theta and trauma even though most of the clinicians that I teach it to properly say, my God, this just this is the most incredible technology there is. Uh, and meanwhile, Seaburn Fisher is selling, you know, uh, her method of training down. And now we have uh, Nicholson and Lanius have their method of training down. And, and they're all in different places and all saying this is the way to go. Obviously, there's lots of ways to go. And there's probably different kinds of ways that people deal with trauma. So that's an interesting topic. How many different ways are people dealing with trauma? What's working? And is it possible that there's different aspects of trauma that affect people's brain differently and has different signatures? Anybody experienced anything like that? I this is Glenda from Colorado, and I yeah, believe it was a, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was Roger maybe who said something about his client was first diagnosed or misdiagnosed PTSD. Maybe he was diagnosed PTSD and then it was misdiagnosed as borderline or bipolar. I just came across a client who had the very same thing, and I was wondering if you would speak on that. My client was in Afghanistan in a room with many other soldiers, and nine people were killed after open gunfire, and he suffers PTSD. So he was he was diagnosed PTSD, but here lately, just this past weekend, he was hospitalized in the VA psych unit and was diagnosed bipolar. Right, which is, which is a shame, because yeah. it, even if you read Vanderkolk, which was 20, I think it was published in 2014, and we're now almost eight years past that, and then you read the latest literature, um, what's being what's being understood, and Vanderkolk and all the people who are heavily involved in trauma, we're seeing as opposed to people who are just policy makers or, you know, around people dealing with trauma, the people who are specializing it, we're seeing that um, what we were calling borderline um, and other personality disorders, uh, the representation of trauma and abuse, childhood abuse, developmental trauma, which wasn't even being accepted as a diagnosis not long ago and is still struggling. That developmental trauma was it was overly represented in those populations, and when they were actually in the trenches doing um, really high quality um, therapy, that really looked like them. That um, a lot of these personality disorders 
had their source in developmental trauma, particularly early trauma. And one thing that I definitely learned in my 20 years of clinical experience is that separating borderline from bipolar from trauma is a really tricky business. And unless you've worked in an institution for a while and really seen bipolar, you don't know what it is. It has a really obvious and special signature. Um, and that's a problem with just listing symptoms and saying, well, if you have this many, it's this and that many, it's that. That's like describing what a certain bird looks like to people. You know, well, it's got these speckles on the breast and it's got a thing on the back. And you go through this like, um, 10 minute explanation the person goes out there and sees you know 15 birds that look like the description and until they see the actual bird they don't get it so i think what's and we had this problem with you weren't supposed to, in the dsm 3r it says explicitly you were not supposed to diagnose somebody with borderline until they were 18 years of age and even then using the dsm was dubious because in the DSM, all the people involved, and it said, this should not be used for diagnosis or as a fundamental basis for diagnosis. They, that was said, it's in the literature, you can read it. Um, and uh, I remember being taught that in abnormal psychology class. So when I started hearing people saying, oh, these children have a childhood bipolar disorder, that flew in the face of everything we had known for decades and decades and decades. And a lot of these people are just PhDs in academia who never worked in a hospital or residential center where they actually saw the bird and really could tell what it was. And so I thought we think we had a lot of misdiagnosis and we still do because people don't really understand what bipolar is. And borderline is so hard to distinguish from PTSD in some cases that even with good instruments, psychometrics, it's difficult. And I can't tell you how many clinicians I've run into who thought they had a borderline and then resolved childhood trauma and the symptoms went away. And Vander Kolk says the same thing and all the people working around him were saying, seeing the same thing. So I'm of the opinion, um, you know, based upon the cohort that I came up with in clinical work, and there were some really sharp people, from Brad Shaw to Vander Kolk and the whole crowd, um, that there's a tremendous amount of misdiagnosis going on, and that the majority of the time, as Vander Kolk says, and uh, now a lot of the people in the complex trauma community said, oh, the majority of the stuff is developmental trauma and complex trauma. But I'm willing, open to hear arguments to the contrary or cases to the contrary. Anybody have? You, you know, Dr. Suter, I've been studying developmental trauma and there's a guy from California who just says, we have adaptive survival styles and we have a, a need for connection. So we have a connection survival style, an attunement, survival style, a trust survival style, autonomy survival style, and love-sexuality survival style. So he, he goes with these core needs or core difficulties where people are disconnected from, you know, their physical and emotional self and have difficulty relating to others for the connection. And attunement, you know, that was the basis of attachment therapy, which we did with our adopted kids, uh, feeling, uh, you know, your feelings. and um, connecting to other people's emotions and then trust what could be more fundamental to any relationship. Uh, we can't depend anybody but ourselves. I mean, that's, yeah. And then uh, difficulty setting limits and saying no, the autonomy survival style. And of course, difficulty with heart and sexuality and the love sexuality survival. So he kind of nailed it for me. He really uh, talks about these core needs that don't get met when you're a young infant. So you kind of go the other way and say, oh, well, I'll just be an island. I don't need other people. And, or I can't connect to my feelings. That's way too scary because, <laughs> you know, little kids are so dependent in their family of origin. It's just, you know, I'm so glad that you and others have brought family systems uh, 
ideas along. But anyway, this guy, I really, uh, he, he's actually writing a second book now, and his, his book is called Healing Developmental Trauma, a guy named Lawrence Heller. And I just think he's a genius in the way he presents it as, you know, these are core needs that get frustrated, not met. And then, you know, it's kind of like, well, <laughs> on the basis of those needs being so not met, then we turn to sort of a, an adaptive or survival style. That's what that's his, his idea. So Carl, let me just, just shoot that back to you that um, in a sense, what he's saying is that there's different aspects of a person that can be um, traumatized and that could shape the way they, conduct themselves, their behavior, they may behave differently based upon what aspect they're most wounded in or challenged in. Does that make sense? Is that similar to what he's saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have difficulty relating to others when you're, you know, your connection is in a survival kind of way. You know, you survive as a young child. You're so dependent on your family of origin and um, if you don't have families that are tuned to you, then, you know, if you, your, your feelings and um, don't get met. And so you begin to discount those and then trust, uh, feeling like we always have to be in control versus no, no, no. We actually <laughs> rely on others. I don't know. It's just it really um, has helped me to understand adoptive children who are from orphanages, which is why I got into this field. I thought, you know, Seaburn Fisher was the person we went to first. And I said, you know, do you see anything? Uh, by the way, will this work with attachment disorder? And she shakes her head affirmatively. Well, it's more than attachment disorder. It's really deep trauma and it's developmental trauma yeah. that you get. So, yeah, I, I just uh, <clears throat> I like that. It makes sense that a person would become borderline or would become, you know, dissociating a lot or. You know, yeah. you know it, it, it was a survival strategy to survive a family that was toxic. Yes, it's a survival strategy. And uh, that's what um, Bradshaw talked a lot about in Family Systems, about how survival strategy shaped people's roles in the family and shaped their scripts and the way they responded. And uh, that influenced my way of thinking. And it sounds very similar to what this guy is saying in another way. And that has also influenced me to when I'm looking at the raw EEG and looking at people's history, I believe I'm seeing different EEG patterns related to different styles of coping with trauma. So it's very close to what you're saying. You know, there's a style of excessive alpha, and that's what um, um, Lanius and Nicholson and Ross are focusing on. There's a style of um, excessive theta, which we've seen for decades in clients who are highly dissociative. It's slowed alpha that looks like theta. Um, and uh, we've seen people um, with really low theta who are a kind of alexithymic. They, they don't show any feeling or emotion. That's how they keep themselves safe. And we have people who are a lot of high beta. They brace physically. They're getting ready for the next whack on the head, uh, slap on the face. And um, so when you start looking at the those EEG patterns in people's histories, you can start and you throw in the ISI, you can start to see there's different styles, adaptive styles for dealing with trauma and, and uh, very similar to what you're talking about. So I think that this guy, um, Heller is on to something because that's also what Bradshaw was kind of talking about, too. Your talk about Bradshaw brings me all the way back. That was that might have been the first group workshop that I went to. I was in social work school and had read one of his books. Uh, it was such an emotional experience. Yes, it was, wasn't it? In the room, there were like 150 people, 20 people wandering through to help you process, you know, and mm -hmm. it was my early introduction to a lot of the impact of family of origin. And it caused me to expand my conceptualization of trauma, meaning it didn't have to be that um, somebody hit you or touched you inappropriately. 
it could be that you were looked at with scorn, you know, and that that years ago that that wasn't really considered trauma, you know, if you're yeah. uh, grew up in a family that didn't validate you and made inferences that you didn't know what you were talking about as a youngster, yes. you know, and the impact of that. So I early on through the Bradshaw work enlarged my concept of trauma and really understood that people had to survive the best they could in their circumstances. Right. And that shaped the work I did in the room because most people were not uh, complimented for their ability to survive these horrible right. situations. Well, that's what Carl was saying too, that mm -hmm. people adapt different survival methods yeah. based upon what the challenge is. This guy, uh, author Heller, which right. is, not a new idea, but it sounds like he's presenting it in a in a in a more in a deeper and more interesting way that's easier to understand. And it um, sets you up to be able to sit across from somebody and change the conversation. Yes. You know, you did what you needed to do to survive. And that also then brings going way back to the Melanie Beattie work about codependent no more, where Yes. Those survival mechanisms are no longer necessary. All of this shaped my early work, put in Judith Herman and Christine Courtois in the same time and frame. Karen Black and uh, all these other yeah. people. And then yeah. Janet Woiditz for the alcoholism in it. Mm -hmm. and, and you make an amalgamation. That's what I sometimes feel like as a therapist. I was an amalgamation of all these people I studied with. I'm sure, sure. Carl, you feel that way that too. Was that was before we identified trauma in a broader sense, but that was the community that was beginning to identify with, with uh, the people in that, in that uh, therapy community. And they had pr pr profound effect. Uh, but by the 90s, we got into the neurobiology of socio-emotional development. And Alan Shore really, really just blew the socks off of everybody starting in the early 90s. And it was, that was when all the brain research was getting really big and functional MRI was really big and we were looking at, now we're looking at the biological origins of trauma and and, and so the, the idea of the family system and the social contributions were becoming eclipsed. But Van der Kolk says, you know, at that same time in the early 90s was when it was painfully obvious to him and all the people around him uh, that the social contribution to trauma was profound and the, the DSM-5 just even hit it more because of this, you know, and I think partly because it was all of this brain science was coming in and saying, well, it's really about the brain and we'll fix it. And when you went to the early neurofeedback um, conferences, it was, well, if we can train the, the central nervous system in the brain, we can fix it all probably. There was this you know, it's always with these new technologies, this new confidence that, yeah, this is the answer. Um, so, and insurance companies like the quick fix, so that was a, also a great reason to want to believe in it, um, because this is the land of the quick fix, right? So here we are 20 years later, and we're still coming up with new ways to struggle with it, but each new effort adds a piece of the puzzle, I think. It, you know, I've always wondered why is it that some people can have terrible experiences as adults or as young adults even, and yet they had secure attachment, they had a family of origin positive experience, so it doesn't become traumatizing. Okay, you know, I had this bad, you know, auto accident or bad medical procedure, or there was a sexual abuse that happened when I was in college, but that that doesn't become no. uh, a trauma that directs, well, they had some safety security needs yes. met in those early years that yes. others did not have. And that's exactly it. I mean, when you look at the definition of toxic stress from the ACE study, it's at the absence of emotional support in the face of um, overwhelming challenge. I mean, it's pretty broadly defined, but the key component is the emotional support, the trust and, and love and affection and uh, nurturing. 
And when you looked, and I saw that back in the um, late 80s, early 90s, the information was coming in both in the social work department and the sociology department and parts of the psychology department, because I was affiliated with all of them at the time. Um, we were seeing information coming in saying longitudinal studies showing abandonment as being more destructive than child abuse, than hitting children. And when they looked at what it was that seemed to make the difference, it was that in the people hitting their kids would show affection, love, and often emotional support despite that, whereas the abandoned kids weren't getting any of that. So there's really strong support, I think, there for what you were saying, Carl, going back the late 80s, early 90s. And it's interesting that uh, from the literature I was looking at, they were saying the brain changes partly as a matter of when the the child or the young adults sort of developmental. I don't know if you buy that adolescence. The joke is that they have a Ferrari engine and the brakes are on back order. That they're living <laughs> in the limbic system. <laughs> I like that. That's a, that's a clinical joke. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that yeah, is so impu impulsive. <laughs> that's uh, too true, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, I think <clears throat> if you don't mind me chipping in, the, yes. I appreciate what you uh, um, the richness of this conversation because of the multi multi dimensionality that exists in the in the mind and how we define it, and um, all these wonderful authors who keep pushing back the frontiers of our understanding of the mind and the mind-body interaction. Now that we've got neuroscience as the biggest tool in the toolbox, we we uh, we can use some objective levers to uh, propel us forward as, uh, as the world keeps changing. So there was a guy I, <coughs> excuse me, clearing my throat. I was a little dry. I gotta take a sip of water. Um, there's a guy, I, I, his name's Al Collins, and he speaks, um, he's done a lot of research on culture and particularly in the East. And so we have this whole other dimension of, uh, uh, of getting back to what our core identity is, right? In, in America, we've got a core identity that's related to the melting pot. So there's an inherent integration that Americans have that's different from, from Europeans who may suffer uh, um, paradoxically, they may be prone, this is what my analyst said, they may be, they seem, when he worked in Zurich, they seem to have more difficulty with uh, borderline dynamics than in America where we have more difficulty with the narcissism, that you know, we're entitled to it, everybody should be, um, treated like little kings <laughs> that's not the I'm, I'm paraphrasing and getting ahead of myself but <clears throat> um uh the complexity just increases with this culture dynamics and uh, you know what i appreciated with you talking about these, these names who influenced us back in the 80s like bradshaw certain concepts just stick in the mind like the the baby looking up at that mobile right so if you're mm -hmm. trying to change a family system you only need one person in the family system to have a radical change and the whole system is going to be changed so that was such an inspiring um concept that motivated me to continue my inner journey with the hope that maybe some change could come about in my family system <laughs> if i changed i didn't see it particularly in my family system but i maybe it's working there and i just can't see it um uh uh and and most recently you, uh i think i'm i mentioned um i've been so impressed with paul jizz's um lens of the polyvagal theory because it's it deals with this a two um the way to get the entunement fine-tuned is to focus in on the tones. So the emotional tones become the critical ingredient um, in how we communicate some of this neuroscience to people who are kind of rigid and stuck in an, some obsessional or uh, autistic uh, trait. Um, so that's uh, th that was the only thoughts that were crossing my mind when you guys were talking about this um 
difference that uh, a patient this morning was just asking me about how how does she, she was asking me how do I differentiate between dissociation and um, just um, daydreaming or the early what, what you spoke about at the beginning of the session the difference between the trauma and um, and traits that may be inherent in the genes or um, passed on from many generations, like we see when there's alcoholism, it's just swept under the carpet and not spoken about. Well, I think that, uh, yeah. you know, uh, daydreaming to some small degree is, is, uh, is part of the normal average human um, mm -hmm. activity. In fact, um, mm -hmm. back in the 80s and 90s, they actually measured the amount of daydreaming. And now, with biometrics and phones, I've seen some recent studies where they even get more accurate on the percentage of time, daydreaming versus ruminating versus constructive thinking. They've got different categories. But um, I think it's like anything else. Uh, if, you're an, if you're a writer and you're an author of fiction, you're going to be, in, in a sense, daydreaming a lot. In mm -hmm. fact, you're going to be creatively using it and harnessing it. Uh, and Einstein did his thought experiment. So there's kind of structured, sophisticated forms of daydreaming, which lead to great scientific discoveries. And uh, that's part of related to alpha theta training. Mm -hmm. But then there is um, daydreaming uh, in order to block internal or external uh, sensations and thoughts and feelings um, so it's a method of blocking things and then it becomes yeah. maladaptive in the same sense sense that um, mind over chatter Ross et al uh, with Laney's writing shotgun um, finding that um, constant chatter which is you know just busy mind as Rob and I were mm -hmm. calling it we were mm -hmm. Rob and I were seeing it in the EEG and talking about it before we were ever aware of that Ruth Lanius and Ross existed um, <laughs> and uh, and and yet they that was the cool thing is they nailed it down with MRI and EEG combined in an experimental design that was very good even though the sample size was small of course, sample size with MRI can be small and great, but if it's with EEG and it's small, well, then it's disreputable. Interesting bias <laughs> going on there. Yeah. yeah. You um, know, I um, wanted to ask, yes. I have to leave it early, two things to the conversation, and I think Vic might appreciate these as well. I worked in a psychiatric hospital, Vic, and mm -hmm. a lot of the girls on the girls in were just labeled as borderline, and they I don't think they really understood that they were truly trauma patients. What became apparent to me is how much trauma they had because the hospital was on the route for the, a main fire department, and every time those fire trucks went by with sirens, and a lot of these girls were from neighborhoods where there was like you know gangs and shootings, they just flipped. It just just triggered trauma. Just hearing a siren go off. You know, and um, on the more recent piece you're talking about, Richard, you know, just kind of shifting gears a bit. Um, one of the things I've discovered about myself, I can, I can, you know, watch TV and, and close my eyes. And then that dialogue is still going on. I, it's like I'm going to fall asleep easily. But if I put on music and close my eyes, it takes me to a different world and I can virtually drift off into sleep. So sometimes the stimuli is quite interesting in how it shifts our thought process or our brain's function. Totally so true. Throw those things out there for discussion. <laughs> Which also, you know, that's why the, the type of sound you use for alpha theta training can be very powerful too. Yeah, absolutely. For the same reason. But the point I was getting at was that um, – Having a busy mind is considered like, well, that's a good thing. You're productive. You have a busy mind. You're an important person with things to do and places to go. And, uh, you know, that's straight out of the 50s. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, because you can, uh, you're really going to go somewhere and the person who walks faster is going to be more successful. And you saw all this stuff in sales uh, uh, 
uh, training and stuff like that along those lines. When in fact, um, you know, here have all these Buddhist people teaching mindfulness, saying like, you know, that's just uh, dissociation. You're not being present when you're in your head all the time. And we see that now as high amplitude alpha, and that's a form of, you know, where you're doing something too much to block your feelings because you can keep your brain busy and looking at your cell phone and playing games and doing stuff to block out um, the discomfort, the challenges of uh, what's coming in at you. And it can become a way of life. So the degree to which you take a natural feature of the human mental landscape and then employ it as a, as a, as a means of controlling the entire landscape um, then I think you're talking about uh, different types of ways of managing trauma, just like Carl was talking about with Lawrence Heller, and just like um, with these styles, and just like Bradshaw with he talked about scripts and um, and roles and family. You know, who's the hero in the family? Who's the rescuer? Who's the clown? So one person distracts everybody by being funny. The other person is 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 keeps everybody happy by being successful everywhere at school and in sports. And the other person is the rescuer who who takes care of the parents and makes sure the house is clean. And out of each of these roles comes a natural way of thinking, feeling, and doing, which is characteristic of that role. And doesn't it make sense? Uh, just like this guy. Heller saying these are different ways that we become, we adapt. And in a really dysfunctional family, they become extreme ways of being in the world and they promote extreme ways of using our brain. And so doesn't it make sense that we're going to see different types of ways of adapting to trauma? So trauma becomes a shape shifter. It hides behind this. It's like inflammation. You know, we know now in medicine that our that what's behind so much of what's going on is the inflammation. And we have to find out what's causing the inflammation and stop treating the symptoms, which is why Rob and I are talking more and more about functional neurofeedback. And that's why we look at family history. We look at nutrition. Uh, we look at uh, uh, how people frame things uh, and cognitive processes. Uh, we take a lot of things into account, how they sleep, and that gives us, um, we see the, where they um, are being uh, undermined and how that leads not only to inflammation, but ultimately to conflict and trauma. Absolutely. Well, just for those that are curious and haven't ever read or heard Bradshaw, he does have his original book out still from 1990, Bradshaw on the Family. One a of the new best. book that came out later on called Healing the Shame, one called Coming Home, and uh, and then another one called The Family, A Revolutionary Way of Self-Discovery. So if you want to look at Bradshaw's work, <laughs> there's plenty to go read out there. Folks, I have to leave early. I've got to get over to the ISNR meeting. I'll see everybody Monday. Bye-bye, Rob. Bye -bye, Rob. Bye -bye. Great. Thanks. Bye -bye. You know, I'll just add that I've noticed that different people respond really differently to eyes closed training. I had one client who was sort of a holistic healing person herself. She did this thing called body talk. And we did some eyes closed training, and I watched the alpha up to 10, up to 15, up to 20, up to 25. And I go, what's going on with this person? Yes, it's amazing, oh, isn't it, when you see that? Ah, oh, it was really striking. And um, she was okay with that kind of training. But my most recent client said, oh, that was too long. 25 minutes of alpha theta, that was just too long. And, I, you know, alpha theta, that's, you know, that's usually very pleasant for most people. But for her to have the eyes closed, to be in that sort of, vulnerable, suggestive. I mean, think about what mm -hmm. happened when the eyes were closed, right? You know, right. nasty stuff might have happened. Or just where do you go when you close your eyes? Right. That's where you need the expert like you to help them understand where to go and how to go there. <laughs> right. Uh, and and there are 
then that's why we do a lot of pre-training before we do alpha theta training. We do a lot of two-channel training to help stabilize, improve sleep, make people more resilient. And that's the same model that's being used, um, uh, that's being promoted by the International Society uh, that deals with complex trauma. Uh, that's their model is you have, before you expose people to the, to the direct feeling related to their trauma, you have to strengthen and build resilience and prepare them for that process. You can't just stick them in the fire because they blow up, they burn, it's, it doesn't work. So I think that that's the case and doing, um, I think it's one of the reasons that training a, a T3, P3, you know, for the, to calm the right amygdala, and that not only calms the amygdala, but also the reticular system if you're doing a bipolar montage at that location, as a pre-training works really well too. And I've used that sometimes, it doesn't always work. Sometimes other areas work better, but that can often be a great technique for a lot of people to help calm them down. And then you put them into alpha theta, and then you start going through the layers of the onion. This complex trauma often has multiple sub-traumatic events in a sense, like sub-concussive events. <laughs> yeah, uh, Richard, can I ask you a question? Sure. <clears throat> um, <laughs> that's very interesting. Uh, the Just the concept of trying to get to the amygdala, right? So even if the, if the client is able to conceptualize that that's the target, it gives them uh, somewhat of a map to be aware of where to go. Um, because uh, I know you're not big on meds, but in the past you've you've kind of indicated that you uh, you understood the value of stimulants, right? But what I'm seeing doing telepsych is that there's an incredible demand that's becoming like overwhelming of people just calling up just to get the stimulant. And they call up and and they tell you what dose, which pill, and what dose, and <laughs> and uh, anything like circadian rhythm is not in their lexicon, and so uh, you know sleep is not 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 even on their um, radar, huh? Radar, yeah, right, right, right. So so I'm just curious, like. Um, Certainly, I can see that the cognitive therapy may be more within their reach if they are on a stimulant because then they can uh, talk themselves through dealing yeah. with the negativity. Absolutely. Um, so so my question to you is, how, uh, how do you deal with this long term once they get used to it? Uh, because then, of course, they, they're already addicted to it. And so it's very hard to come down on the dose, just the same as we've been dealing yes. with the just the same as we've been dealing with the benzos, right? It's uh, yes. if you over if you're over sixty, it's like uh, <clears throat> uh, it's really swimming upstream. So so now I, I'm I'm getting the same thing with the stimulants, like how to how to slowly lower it and get people to think more amygdala than just a prefrontal lobe cortical improvement. So I you know I'm not anti med. I'm I'm anti abuse of meds. Uh -huh, uh, okay. Yeah, really, and I know I sound mm -hmm. anti-med, but I, that's because uh, we're always up against this abusive use of medications, you know, mm -hmm. as the final solution, mm -hmm. and, and and the relegation of therapists to uh, an impoverished professional is a uh, position where they only make more than sixty or seventy thousand dollars a year max, with massive school loans and uh, and really low status when they're the people who pick up all all the leftover garbage of our culture who oh. help people put it back together again and, and that's what bothers me but in terms of medication I completely agree with you there's an important place for it and it's critical to use it at the right time but there's also a time to back off and I think once you're in a therapeutic situation and you've gotten them to focus and they are starting the process they have to start giving up the crutch because the fact is the medications um, 
disconnect the cortical process from the emotional process. That's why they're able to stabilize people. And if that's the case, you can't take what Joseph Ledoux calls implicit information, explicit memory, and integrate it with you know the limbic stuff and the sensory memory banks, put it together and integrate it into the cortical process and the person's personal narrative. And if you can't make that journey, you're not going to heal. And mm -hmm. that's a, a more psychological and qualia aspect that people in the deductive sciences can't grasp. They, they seem to be sociopathic almost in that sense. They can't grasp the importance of qualia. They're not interested in the flavor of chocolate. They're just interested in the sales and how much you eat you know, and all of that. Um, but once I have somebody's attention and we're making progress and I'm using neurofeedback, I'm on them about reducing the medication because I found if I can't get them to do that, they don't really recover. They can't really integrate the trauma related to the, emo the emotions related to the trauma, recover memories, have the dreams they need to have, and integrate the trauma. It's, and it's just, and I'm convinced, you know, uh, and I'm not alone. That my ideas are over a hundred years old. You will never recover people unless you take all of those things into account. So to me, neurofeedback is a tool, drugs are a tool, nutrition is a tool, and they all need to be used appropriately. It's, and sleep is important too. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> that's wonderfully said. Thank you, uh, Richard. I, I've got a one o'clock already in my waiting room too. I Excuse totally me. get that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Talk to you later. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Vic. Judy, you've been I've been really listening to everything going on and and um, just processing it. You know, I think about the medication and I I as an LCSW, I'm really I tell people it's outside of the scope of my practice to mm. work on lessening the medicine. And I do think that you will begin to feel some of the side effects of it. And I think right now you should let your provider know what you're doing and uh -oh. that you may come to them second Judy. did you lose oh, me I I, i'm here did you I, are you hearing me now we hear you judy oh very yeah, good we, very we good. can hear you okay good so i i tell people reach out to your provider and let them know about the neurofeedback reach back to me if they don't understand neurofeedback and i'll get a release and i'm happy to talk to them but also to get them to coordinate with you around lessening some of the medication. Yeah. I talk about that. Um, right off the bat, I talk about that. You know, yesterday I had somebody, and that's, I guess, a different, I don't want to go too far with it, but I had somebody on clonopin, at least a milligram a day, whose physiology score was 365. Ooh. And I said I wasn't going to do neurofeedback until she saw the right people to manage some of this physiology. You know, I guess in some ways, I, the point to, I guess to bring around, because we could talk about this other situation is, is you have to be really prepared to take some stands in the room when you're working with people with the neurofeedback. In the beginning, that was hard for me because I was so insecure and unsure. And it's gotten, I've gotten more confident over the years where I'm willing to say, if you stay doing what you're doing, we'll get a little bit of good effect, but not what we could if you made some changes. Mm -hmm. And to, to emphasize, and there are certain, for example, if I'm doing, whether it's alpha theta or Fisher's reactivity, the trauma work, if I'm doing that, they have to be in therapy. If they come to me and they haven't given me a release for the therapist, and then they say to me, no, I'm not in therapy. I say, we stop doing this. I'll change the course, but yeah. I won't do it without, you know, you, mm -hmm. I've come to make some lines that I won't cross. And I think that's so necessary, particularly because of this conversation that we're talking about, you know, these people need us to do that and model that. 
you know? Yes, they do. And it is a real gray area because of the way we we compartmentalized healing and uh, health services. Yeah. It, it makes it tricky. And you do have to take care how you manage that. And I do think some people don't come back to me because I set those boundaries where I want them to be experiencing functional neurofeedback, you know, right. I right. really, and I make that clear. This is my expectation of you. You have expectations of me. These are my expectations of you. And some of them don't come back because I, I, I make my first appointment fairly inexpensive so they can dip their toe in the water, you know. And, yeah. But, but the ones that come back, they know where we stand, and we stand there together, shoulder to shoulder. Yeah, and you feel much more um, sol on solid ground with them, probably too. I bet. Yep. In terms of the relationship and what's expected. And I have a. We're just about at the top of the hour. Yeah, we are. So I guess we'll yeah. have to to end this. But uh, that's always a good ongoing topic of you know. How do you manage people with a lot of health problems? You know, what's your strategy? And there's different ways, but maybe we can. Let's get put to that, that out next. as a topic. Yeah. I'll write it to Rob. Sounds good. All right. Well, everybody have a great weekend. Thank we'll you for your contributions, night. folks. And we look forward. I w I'll present my boy with high functioning autism, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, that should be very interesting. Yeah, I think so too. So well, see you Monday. Monday. Have a great yep. weekend, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.